grace and peace to you this Thursday morning, uh, the 4th of February. It's good to be before you. Um, I will be uh, sharing with you one of my uh, favorite church fathers, one that I did research on. I did a senior paper on him um, translating. Because of him, I got to go into the Rice Library looking for a uh, certain author from Alexandria, uh, a, uh, what's what's called a pseudo epigrapha. A uh, basically a pseudo epigrapha is is a text that was written by somebody claiming to be somebody else. Um, so and it was known that he had written it. So it was a fun little research into a, a fine sacred library there at Rice University. They have a great liberal arts library. Um, I was able to find what I needed to do, even though I came from a small little college in central Texas. Uh, they let me in <laughs> to do some research. But this is uh, the theologian I'll be talking about is Tertullian. Um, it seems that yesterday I, I uh, thought I received the COVID vaccine with minimal side effects. And that was early in the morning. I had minimal side effects. But as the day went on, um, I developed a distinct soreness in my left arm where the shot was, and uh, which is typical of people who get their first shot. And for some reason, it was very hard for me to keep my focus on work, um, especially typing and filling out forms. We so uh, it was just really hard. And uh, the good side effect is I had a great night's sleep because I was really tired by the end of the day. So, um, you know, hopefully today will be a better day. I can concentrate better. Um, and I start out the day with uh, Tertullian. Um, Tertullian, like I said, is one of my favorite and he is, I'm going to be reading him. And while I read him, I want to share um, the view. Because Tertullian is from Carthage. And his um, Latin name, his birth name, is Quintus Septimius Florens Tertullianus, and he's from Carthage, a Roman province of Africa. Uh, he's of Berber and Phoenician origin. Uh, and what, what is unusual is if you look at all these, they look very uh, Roman, European. Uh, this is a more contemporary picture of him. Uh, being from Carthage is North Africa, what we would call Tunisia um, and or Algeria, that area. And um, being Berber means that he was part African. So it, it amazes me how uh, because uh, people are from Africa, uh, they assume that they're, you know, artists will assume that they look more European. It's just like in movies, um, uh, a good Roman Caesar accent is someone who sounds like he's British, a uh, large part because most of the movies that have been done about Rome are from the British. So we, we forget that Italians probably, they spoke Latin, but with a really strong, heavy Italian accent. Uh, we for, tend to forget that. Uh, so here's what... Tertullian's writing, and again, remember, he is fighting against heresies. Uh, the biggest heresy at this time in the church, which was uh, he lived from uh, 155 to 240. So technically, he's about 120 years beyond Jesus's death. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of how we, we time it. So he is fighting a what's called a heresy called Gnosticism that said Jesus was really God pretending 
to be a man. Uh, and God having the power could have actually done that. Uh, but if you take that thought further to its conclusion, um, if God was just appearing to be a man on earth in the form of Jesus, then he only appeared to die on the cross. So this section is called Jesus Really Died. And it's connected to Romans 14, 9. For this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. So this is Tertullian. Was not God really crucified? And having been crucified, didn't, did, didn't he really die? And having died, didn't he really rise again? If not, Paul would have falsely determined to know nothing among us but Jesus and him crucified. He would have falsely imposed on us that Christ was buried and rose again. Then our faith is also false. And all that we hope for from Christ is a dream. You who acquit the murderers of God from guilt are a disgrace. For Christ did not suffer from them if he really never suffered. You Will you spare the whole world from its only hope by destroying the essential dishonor of our faith? Whatever is unworthy of God is profitable to me. I am, I am safe if I am not ashamed of my Lord. Whosoever, he says, shall be ashamed of me, of him will I also be ashamed. The Son of God was crucified. I am not ashamed because mankind must be ashamed of it. And the Son of God died. It is by all means to be, to be believed because it is absurd. <coughs> He was raised, he was buried and rose again. The fact is certain because it is impossible. But how will all this be true if he wasn't true himself? If he hadn't, if he hadn't had within himself that which might be crucified, might die and might be buried and might rise again. You see, he's arguing that Christ really was crucified because Christ was really a human, a man. And that if he wasn't crucified, then everything we believe in is a lie. And, and the reason that we can believe in resurrection is because of its impossibility. It takes faith. And it's the only thing that God can do. Even if God is Jesus the man. He was fighting an uphill battle. Um, and it's one that, thank God, he won. So let us continue uh, this morning with our morning devotion. This is uh, from Luther. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon Peter's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. And they told Jesus about her at once. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought Jesus all who were sick and possessed with demons. The whole city was gathered around the door, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, Jesus got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him, when they found Jesus, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came to do. 
And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The text, uh, the devotion this morning, comes from Ron Letness, and he writes, The Minnesota All-State Lutheran Choir was scheduled to perform at Shetek, I'm hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, it could be Shetek, uh, Shetek uh, Lutheran Bible Camp, where I was executive director. I was not feeling well, yet I felt the need to introduce the choir. Following the welcome and the introduction, I sat apart and listened. I remembered one song in particular, the African-American spiritual, Give Me Jesus. I wept. By the end of the concert, I felt normal. Yes, there are probably sound medical reasons why the fever broke. Healing happens in many ways and for many reasons. The music was a metaphor for God's healing action. Yet I hear a voice asking, how does the name of Jesus factor into healing? A colleague shared his experience in counseling a young woman possessed by its. Out of her mouth came a demonic snarls. Following psychiatric counseling and group prayer sessions, my friend retorted to its. In the name of Jesus, shut up. Its left and went to the abyss. Give me Jesus. You can have all the rest. Let us pray. Holy Jesus, you have come to transform the world. We yield in gratitude to your spirit of life. Amen. As I normally do, I will be concluding with my good friend, Steve. It's good uh, that he writes this morning. I appreciate him getting up as early as I do. And he writes, 100 years from now, people living on a greener earth in a kinder society will thank us for what we are doing today. They will see us on holograms, wearing our masks and looking earnestly into the camera. The people who lost their smiles, they will call us. For so long, our smiles were hidden, but not our tears. The history classes of that time will show the depth of the struggle and the loss. It will, um, it will amaze future generations how resilient we were, adapting to every assault, moving forward against great odds. We may not feel ho so heroic, but they will see some of us that way. We will be beacons in the dark part of history, a proof that people are stronger when they stand together. 100 years from today, people will remember us and be grateful. That's why today, and all days like it are so important. Well, enjoy this Thursday, 4th of February. Practice your social protocols, social distancing, wearing a mask, washing your hands. That's one way to be a blessing to a neighbor. Continue to be that blessing to those around you. Take care of yourselves and take care of a neighbor and take care of your family and take care of your friends. Stay healthy. Amen.